I don't know if this happens in your family, in your household, but if you walk into a room and somebody's watching television, what do you automatically say? What are you watching? What are you watching, right? That's what we're going to talk about today. What are you watching? I'm not talking just about television, but what are you watching as a Christian? Advent, I think, is made up of a whole bunch of W's, even though the letter W doesn't appear in the word Advent. And those W's are waiting and watching and wondering and worshiping. And we're going to be focusing upon those throughout Advent. But today, here, we're going to focus on watching. Chris Anderson, who is one of our seminarians, is preaching about waiting at the East Campus, and he'll be here next week preaching on waiting. And uh, my wife texted me at 8.15. She was at the 8 o'clock service and said, Chris isn't here yet. I'm hoping it was a sermon illustration that he was doing on waiting. That, um, but John Lewis is over there. He's in charge. I'm not going to worry about this. So he's, it's, it's his thing. So, watching. During Advent, <clears throat> some of the watching that we talk about is, is all the watching that is done for the Christ child, the birth of the Christ child. And so a lot of our preparations are how do we prepare for the Christ child to come into our life. The other watching focused upon in Advent is watching for the end times, the return of Christ, and, and how do we prepare for that. One of the things that I think we need to figure out is this. We need to watch out on how we watch for the end times. Okay? The reason I say that is during my lifetime, just a short 56 years, <clears throat> I have found, I'm sure there are more, but I have found over 73 predictions of the end times happening between the time I was born until today. 73 have predicted the end times they were all wrong. Jesus, in Matthew 25, 13, says this. At the end of that parable that we talked about a few weeks ago uh, in stewardship, when we looked at time, about the, the ten virgins, five foolish, five were wise, they were waiting for the bridegroom to come. Some brought oil, some didn't, so they were prepared, and others weren't prepared, right? Jesus summarizes that whole parable by saying this. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour right? We don't know the day or the hour. We're supposed to watch. We watch for the signs, but we don't know the day or the hour, right? Y2K, how many of you remember Y2K, right? Everything was coming to a grinding halt. The grid was going down. Total catastrophe. I missed it, right? It didn't happen, right? The latest one are blood moons, right? Intriguing <clears throat> phenomenon, is something going to happen? Maybe. Has something happened in the past tied to them? Yeah. Something now? Don't know. Maybe. Possibly. Who knows, right? Jesus says, watch for the signs, but you're not going to know when it happens. So why do we watch for the signs? If, if it's not going to happen, why do we watch? We watch to be prepared. Okay? It's like, um, I'm going to make this up. Don't panic. This is total, total... Uh, folklore here. Imagine the weatherman says, at midnight tonight, it's going to start snowing, and by six o'clock tomorrow morning, you're going to have a foot of snow. Okay, I made this up. Don't panic, right? right? What would you do with that information? Would you get out your meteorological charts and books to check to see if, if that meteorologist is going to be right? There might be one of you in the crowd that's going to do that. The rest of us, that's not what we do, right? Would you write a book upon it to get published before 6 o'clock tomorrow morning? N no, probably not, right? What would you do with that information? Well, what I would do is I would get my snow shovel <clears throat> close to the front door. I would make sure that I've gone and bought a bunch of ice melt so I'm ready to go, and I'd get gas <clears throat> and put it in my snowblower, right? Why would I? I use that information to be prepared, right? Now, how many of you have experienced that it doesn't start snowing at midnight? It starts at 11 o'clock. It might start at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. It might be 
12 inches of snow. It might be 2 feet of snow. It might be 2 inches of snow. It might not snow at all. Anybody experience that? Right, yeah. And then you go, well, I'm never listening to that weatherman again. No. We watch for the signs, right? We watch for the clouds. We watch for the, the humidity in those clouds. We watch for the, 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 what do they call it, the polar equinox to come through or whatever it's called, right? We make up all kinds of new words. We watch for those signs so that we can be prepared, right? That's the same type of thing we're talking about as Christians. A part of being prepared, I think, is also watching. Not just watching for the signs, not just watching for the end times, but watching what we do in our lives as Christians. That's how we become prepared. The first watching that I want to talk about is this. Jesus says in Matthew 16, he also <clears throat> is stated in uh, Mark chapter 8, this. Jesus said to them, Watch and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then he repeats it a little bit later. He says, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He explains it to his disciples, and the disciples say they finally understood that he was not telling them to beware the leaven in the bread of the Pharisees and Sadducees, but beware the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees, their fundamental teaching was this. It was all about religious legalism. That you were lived out your religiosity through legal traditions, by keeping the law, right? Faith was <clears throat> something that wasn't even discussed. It was all about you keeping the law. The Sadducees were similar, but they weren't so much about keeping the law as they were about keeping the traditions of religiosity in their worship life, right? The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the devil. They didn't believe in any of that stuff. They just believed in going through the motions. Jesus is saying, watch out for the, the puffed up religiosity of self-centeredness, right? Prideful self-centered worship and, and, and religiosity. What does leaven do? When you put leaven in bread, what does it do? It rises. It puffs it up, right? So Jesus is basically saying, beware of the puffing up of the Pharisees, the puffing up of the Sadducees, the puffing up of the self in your own religiosity. Because your focus will be upon who? Yourself. And not upon God, the source of your salvation. So he says, watch out. We also need to watch out for the temptation to sin. Right? <clears throat> we need to watch out for the temptation to sin. Well, how do we do that? Jesus says this in Matthew 26, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We have this battle that goes on within us throughout our entire lives. We need to watch out for the temptation to sin. When, <clears throat> when I talk about tempting, the, the image that just comes to mind, I love fishing, is this. The temptation is like a lure, right? And, and when you're out pan fishing, trying to catch sunnies and bluegills and stuff like that, and, and you have the worm, and you put the worm on the hook. How many are fishermen in here? How, how detailed do I have to get? Not very many. I need to get a little more detailed. When you got the worm, okay, if you want to catch a fish, you have to take that worm, and what do you have to hide? The hook. I mean, you got to hide the whole hook. You can't have any part of the hook being seen so that there is just this worm, because that worm is really tempting to that fish, right? And that fish will bite on that worm because they believe it's a worm, and then they discover what? The hook. We need to watch out for our temptation so that we don't bite into something that has a hook, right? And the world, guys, the world wants us to believe everything is okay. Well, guess what? Everything's not okay. There is stuff that has hooks in it. And we as Christians are called to watch out in our temptation. The first thing you do to do this is this. You admit that temptation works. You admit that you are a sinner. 
All of us. Not, there isn't a single one of us in here that is not a sinner. The first thing that we have to recognize is we have a tendency to sin. And in the midst of that tendency, we need help, right? We need help from God. I like uh, James 1. <clears throat> talks about this. That we are, we are to recognize our fleshly desires. And when temptation comes, we're not to be surprised that we're tempted by something, right? It should be expected. What we try to do, first, is to run away from that temptation, right? The best thing to do is to run away from that temptation. Because if you run away from the temptation, you will not sin. Being tempted is not sin. Giving in to temptation is sin. So running away from the temptation keeps us from sinning, right? Which is what we want to do, right? We want to keep from sinning. We hear this <coughs> in 1 Corinthians 10, the ver- uh, 13th chapter. This is a New Living Translation. I like their, their, the way they write it out here. It says, but remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. We all experience temptation, right? All of us. Some of us have certain temptations that we're drawn to, and, and others of us are like, why is that tempting to you? And yet we have our own unique temptations, right? And God is faithful. Even in the midst of our temptations, God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. And when you're tempted, He will show you a way out so that you will not give in. So maybe one of the things <clears throat> when we recognize that we are being tempted is to pray to God saying, Lord, this is too strong for me. I need a way out. Help me and show me that way out so I can avoid this temptation, right? One of the ways that we do this is, is living in the word of truth. Hebrews 4.12 says, God's word is living and active. It's living and active. In other words, God's Word is given to us in our lives, living and active, so that we can use it not only to identify temptation, but also to discover a way out of that temptation. And when we are focused upon the Word of God, it is amazing, when we are focused upon the Word of God, things seem to be a lot clearer in life. Not so much grays, but a lot of more clarity where we can understand what is right and what is wrong and what God's desire is for us. God's Word is helpful. In the midst of that, we can, we can deal with our temptation through something that you probably haven't thought of, is praise. You can deal with temptation by praising God. L- let me ask you this. <clears throat> when in worship, we are singing and it's a song that you just love and it's just stirring deep in you, and and you're just moved and overwhelmed, how many of you are tempted at that moment? Yeah, it's not there, right? It's just not there. Because you're focused again on who? God. And, And you're not focused upon yourself. So in the midst of our praise, in the midst of our worship, becomes an opportunity to deal with our temptation. When something is tempting you, start praising God. Singing to God. Focusing upon God and and that temptation loses its lure. It loses its power. It loses its hook. It's gone. Hmm. But we will give in. So what do we do when we give in to temptation and sin? Should we sweep it under the rug? Should we ignore it? Should we defend it? Should we make excuses for it? Should we uh, try to cover it up? No, because the burden is still there. You're pretending it's not there, but it's still there. What we're called to do as Christians is to confess, to repent, to seek restoration and forgiveness so that our burden is taken away and temptation loses its power. We also, in our watching, not just watch against our own self-centered religiosity or our our, uh, temptation to sin, but we are also to watch out for each other, to take care of each other, to have community with each other. Galatians 5, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's a whole bunch of words in English. It's one word in Greek. 
One word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But there's a verse 15 that goes on. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. So verse 14 says, love each other, take care of each other. If you don't do it, you're going to destroy each other. Those are just kind of the two options that we have, right? By taking care of each other, we have all kinds of opportunities in the life of our congregation and outside of our congregation in your lives. We need to pray for God to open up our eyes, open up our hearts, open up our lives to the lives of others so that we can touch them in important ways. One of the things our congregation has been doing for years is helping out with the Stevens Center. It's a homeless shelter down on Q Street. And every month, the fourth through the month, with the exception of uh, uh, several months, um, <clears throat> we prepare a meal and we have people from our congregation that serve that meal down at the Homeless Center at the Stevens Center. Marilyn Stamm has, has been in charge of that ministry for a long, long time. Check it out. It might be something that you want to help Marilyn and help out uh, the homeless with. We uh, also have a, a segment of our congregation from South Sudan, and <clears throat> a lot of them are ill-prepared for that foot of snow that's going to start at midnight tonight. I'm joking. It's not going to start. It's not going to happen. But what we're doing is we're doing a coat drive. And I love it because at both campuses, we have these bins and, and a sign on coats for Sudanese. And at both campuses, they are overflowing with coats, right? Now these coats, what our members do is, our Sudanese members, they take these coats. They don't just use them themselves. They take them and they distribute them throughout the Sudanese community so they become an important part of impacting the lives of others in an important way, helping people be ready for this winter that are ill-prepared. We also have mitten trees. They're up. They're ready to go. I checked it. It has no mittens on it yet. We got to fill that mitten tree with mittens so that we can get uh, hand coverings to kids who are without. <clears throat> we have welcome center bins out there that help with this, the Omaha South Lutheran Pantry uh, that keep it well stocked with food supplies, Project Hope clothing and, and food supplies. Uh, the Stevens Center I mentioned, the Senior Care Ministries reaching out to people that, that may uh, have, have little connection with family anymore and are in nursing homes. And our congregation goes out every month and ministers to those individuals. Um, God will ministry, prayer shawl ministry, Stephen ministry, uh, where people do one-on-one -on -one sessions with individuals that might be grieving through a loss or a traumatic event that have happened, who've been trained to go and undercover, you don't even hear about this, it's all confidential, ministering to these individuals. And the list just goes on and on and on. That's just here in our congregation this month. Imagine as we look at each one of our lives and the people that we encounter and the impact that we can make in the name of Jesus Christ. We need to watch out for each other. And lastly, we need to watch for the truth. We need to be in God's Word. <clears throat> and the reason we need to do this is so that we know the signs, so that we understand how temptation and sin works and and what we have been given by God to deal with it. So that we can fight against self-centered and, and puffing our own selves up in our own religiosity. And at the same time separating ourselves from God. God's truth reveals that. God's truth reveals how Christ, out of love for us, died on the cross. And expects us to have that same love flowing out of us to impact our community. That's the importance of learning God's truth. 1 Timothy 4 says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to proclaiming it, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the elders <clears throat> laid their hands upon you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that they may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and and your hearers. We need to get into God's Word daily. And I don't care what age you are at. Um, we have opportunity to do that at any age. Kids. We have these Bibles. They're called Hands-On Bible. Experience the fun. Live the truth. This is a New Living Translation. <clears throat> it's geared just for kids. And every now and then it'll have little devotional pieces in here where parents can, can uh, talk deeper about whatever is being discussed 
in the biblical text. Excellent resource. Grandparents, great Christmas gift. Also, for teenagers, we have uh, Bibles that are called Apologetic Study Bible for Students. Hard questions, straight answers. Again, this uh, particular text <clears throat> has in it great footnotes that run across the bottom, but every now and then there will be a, a personal story that will talk about um, how the truth, that's basically what apologetics is, is speaking the truth, talks about uh, a life situation where someone applied this biblical truth in their life. And then there are discussion questions underneath that that, that help uh, understanding biblical application in their own life. You might say, you know, I really would like to become a part of a small group. As a matter of fact, I know some friends of mine, and <clears throat> we would like to start a small group, but I've never been in a small group. I don't know the Bible that well, um, and, and I don't know what to possibly use. And so as a result, you end up doing nothing. I mean, it's crazy. People will say, I'm, I don't want to join a Bible study because I don't know the Bible well enough. How do you think you're going to get to know the Bible better? By not getting into the Bible? I mean, that's, that's kind of the logic behind that. You, you jump into a Bible study so that you will become better in the Bible. Have I got the Bible for you? It's called the Serendipity Study Bible. We've been using this for, oh gosh, 20-some years in the life of our congregation. <clears throat> it is so cool because you can open up. Here, I'll open up to a really popular part of the Bible. Oh, back here, this will be good. Um, I'll open up to Leviticus chapter 14, okay? Leviticus chapter 14. I know all of you want to do a Bible study on that this afternoon, right? Leviticus chapter 14. In the margins, you have your biblical text here, on the, the outside margins are a series of questions. And so the first question is an opening question. And the opening question for this one is, how would you describe your housekeeping? Anybody can answer that, right? Good, bad, indifferent, right? One of, the, one of those, right? It's an opening question. Just kind of loosens everybody up so you can talk about something. And then the next section is dig questions where you can dig deeper in the text. And so it asks you questions on the text that, that you and your group can talk about. And then it moves down into a reflect section where you begin to move into life application of the biblical text how this implies. So you, at a moment, so I could hand this Bible to you, and I could say, Rachel, lead a Bible study on Leviticus 14. Here you go. And she could do it. It's that easy. Anybody could do it. You just read the questions and deal with them. Another great resource is this. <clears throat> Luther's small catechism with explanation. We've got tons of these. We'll buy more if we run out. It gives you the basic teachings of the Christian faith and biblical references. <clears throat> it takes you through the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer. It takes you through baptism, Holy Communion, the basic tenets of the church. Great resource. We need, folks, <clears throat> if we are to watch as Christians, to know the signs, to be able to live our lives as Christians, we need to be able to watch in all of these areas. We're called to do this. We're called to be prepared to have the gas in our snowblower, to be ready when our Lord returns, to live out our lives as Christians, impacting the lives of those around us with the love that God first shown us, to teach them to live out the fact that all of us are sinners in need of forgiveness, that we are called not to be hypocrites, but to be real about our faith, about our love, about our life, about our Lord. It's in His holy and precious name. Amen.